the song that we just sang, Ask What You Will, Your Prayer Shall Be Granted, is very true in relationship to our prayers to the Father through Christ when they are asked according to the will of God. But sometimes people ask things and make requests of God that they do not know, realize what it is. A good illustration of that would be in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verses 20 through 22. When the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons come to Jesus, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. They asked him, Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. In this situation, that which the mother of Zebedee's children which is James and John, asked something that was in reality out of harmony with God's will. And Jesus tells her, you don't know what you're asking. You know not what you ask. You don't understand what you're asking. Of course, the implication for one thing is that if she and if they, because she is coming apparently with James and John, that means that they are there with her and making that request with her and maybe through her. But the implication, if they had known God's will, they would not have made such a request as what they made. And in reality, when we understand God's will, we understand totally that statement by Jesus. You know not what you ask. Do you really understand what you're asking in this regard? Of course, to sit on his right hand and on his left hand, he says, is not mine to give, but is my, of my Father. But we know now that those on the right hand will be eternally blessed and those on the left hand will be eternally tormented. Is that really what she meant when she was asking that? Of course not. And so she literally did not understand what she asked. If she had known God's will about that, she would not have made such a request. But that does teach us the need for very plain, clear teaching of God's word. Paul tells Timothy, that I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his peering and in, it, and in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. In St. Timothy 4 verses 1 and verse 2. Peter would state that if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. We need clear teaching of God's word so that we will not make requests that are out of harmony with God's will, so that our request will be in harmony with that will. But we also have the obligation to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so our need to study God's word on an individual basis not only in relationship to the preaching that is being done, but also studying ourselves so that we will know what God's will is. And yes, that preaching that is, to, that is done in accordance with God's will, but it's our obligation to make sure that it is in accordance with God's will. The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, 
because they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so, Acts 17 and verse 11. And so we need to know God's will so that we will ask in accordance with that. But there are a lot of requests being made today in which people literally do not know what they ask. One of those things is that people ask for the kingdom to come. We hear many prayers expressing such. Many erroneously simply quote the example prayer that's found in Matthew the 6th chapter verses, six, uh, verses 9 through 13 where it says, or Jesus states, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, hallowed um, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth or in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The thing to notice at the beginning of that prayer, or before the prayer begins, actually, if you want to call it a prayer, is the words of Jesus, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. It does not state, Jesus does not say, after these words, therefore, pray ye. That's what so many in our society today have changed this into being. After these words, therefore, pray ye. And so they will recite those words that Jesus gave. And then they call it, they misname it, the Lord's Prayer. This isn't the Lord's Prayer. If anything, it would be the disciples' prayer because it is an example to them as to how to pray. But it's not expressing necessarily the sentiments of our Lord. If you want a prayer that can be called the Lord's Prayer, go to John the 17th chapter and read the prayer of Jesus there. That's truly the Lord's Prayer where he prays first for himself. Then he prays for the apostles. Then he prays for all of those who would believe on the apostles' teaching. That teaching that, of course, would come from and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That would be the Lord's Prayer. But not this example prayer. This is an example. It is an illustration to the disciples to teach them how to pray. It is a teaching prayer. But in that prayer, there is that phrase that we hear, Thy kingdom come. And thus, in, as people recite this phrase, this phraseology as a prayer to God, they would be praying for the kingdom to come. And so we understand that a lot of people are teaching and praying for the kingdom to come. But the Bible, as you study the Bible, emphatically teaches that the kingdom is not in the future, it already exists. That the kingdom is come, has come, and that that kingdom is the church of our Lord. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, Jesus takes his apostles to Caesarea Philippi, a city that is literally built upon a rock. And he first asks them, who do men say that I am? And they tell him that some think that you're John the Baptist or one of the prophets. He then asks them, who do you think that I am? And Peter, responding for the, the apostles, states that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus tells Peter that flesh and blood is not revealed in unto thee, that statement, but the Father in heaven. In other words, 
you have seen the evidences that the Father has given. He has been witnessing to me. And if you want a further study of that, study John the 8th chapter, in which he states that the Father was bearing witness to him, not simply himself bearing witness. But he also says that there's other things that bear witness to who he says he was, that he is the Son of God. But the Father has. They had seen those evidences, that testimony of the Father about the Son, Jesus of Nazareth. And so flesh and blood hasn't revealed it, but my Father in heaven. And then he says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now there's those who would deny the difference between the words Peter and rock there. And some have even mistranslated it in such a way as to read that thou art Peter a rock. No, Peter was a little small pebble is what he's saying. But upon this rock, this boulder, I will build my church. And thus the church was not built upon Peter as some want to teach it today. But the church was being built upon that confession that Peter made that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the rock upon which the church is built. And we would see that in Paul's statement, for example, in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, that upon uh, that um, Jesus is that that there is no under the name given. That's verse Acts 4 and verse 12. Started quoting that. I can't even for the life of me think what 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11 says now. But uh, see, that's why I try and copy all of my scriptures down and have them before me. But I get off into tangent, forget sometimes. Uh, hmm? Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Christ is that foundation. Thank you. See, once I got started, I could quote it, but uh, Christ is that foundation, not Peter. And no other foundation, he says. And yet they will still say Peter is the foundation of the church. No, Peter was not the foundation of the church. That confession that he made was, I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. By the way, that does not teach the eternal nature of the church. There's other passages that do, but that doesn't. Jesus is staying in that statement that I'm going to go into the Hadean realm, but the Hadean realm will not prevent me from establishing the church. In other words, I'm not going to remain in the Hadean world. I'm going to be raised from the dead. And through that resurrection, what? I'll prove that I'm the Son of God, Romans 1 and verse 4, and upon that build my church. So the gates of Hades will not prevent me from establishing the church. That's what he's saying in that phrase. But then he goes on into verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Now he's talking about the establishment of the church, but he's going to give Peter the keys of the kingdom. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is not giving Peter the right to bind and loose. The actual statement, if you want to get into the tense of the Greek word that's translated shall be bound in heaven and shall be loosed in, in heaven, literally means a past action with continuing results. That's the meaning of the Greek tense. And so you have a past action, something that has already been bound and continues to be bound in heaven. Something that has been loosed in heaven and continues to be loosed is what Jesus is saying in that. He is stating, Peter, I'm going to give unto you, and if we understand this from other passages of Scripture, 
I'm going to give unto you and to the other, other apostles. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and they're going to guide you into all truth. They are going to reveal unto you what God's Word is. And you will then preach and teach that Word that God has determined in relationship to the binding and loosing of sins. And that which God gives unto you will continue until the end of the age. Now that's the idea that Jesus is expressing. But here I'm going to build my church and I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And in that Giving you the keys of the kingdom is, that is, to enter into that which I'm establishing, which is the church. And so he uses these two terms, the kingdom and the church, interchangeably. They do not mean the same thing. We shouldn't express it as such. While they don't mean the same thing, they do apply and have reference to the same institution. A mother, a daughter, a wife, those terms do not mean the same thing. But they might have reference to the same woman. Same thing in relationship to this. The word church has a meaning. The word kingdom has a different meaning, but they have reference to the same institution. And in, in Mark, the ninth chapter. In verse 1, Jesus says to, to his apostles again, to others, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them which stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now we've got some who are saying and praying still for the kingdom to come. In fact, the premillennialists will still looking for a kingdom to come. And that Christ is going to have to come back to this earth to establish his kingdom. It's yet in the future. Jesus tells the people that day, some of you are who are here at this time. That's 2,000 years ago. You will not die till you have seen the kingdom come. If the premillennialists and these people who pray for the coming of the kingdom are right, then we've got some awful old people. And the Guinness Book of World Records needs to change their records because we've got some who are a lot older than what they say. We've got some people who are way older. They'd make uh, Methuselah look like a child because they're so old. And if Doug McClish was here, I'd say they would be as old as him. But... Uh, there's going to be some that will see the kingdom come. Will not die till the kingdom comes. But the kingdom, he says, is going to come with power. Later on to the apostles, as he's meeting with them prior to his ascension into heaven, as recorded by the beloved physician Luke in Acts chapter 1. Starting in verse 6, he says that when they therefore were come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses uh, unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? Well, that's when that decision is going to be when the Father sends the Holy Spirit into you. And when you receive that power, 
with the coming of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom is going to be restored. Now, they were thinking from a physical sense. There's no doubt about it as to the words of the, their question. They were thinking that Jesus was going to establish a physical, earthly kingdom in which he would rule in Jerusalem, just like David did in the long ago. And so they are asking it from that perspective. But Jesus says, no, there's going to come a kingdom, but it's going to come when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to receive power. Now, in, in Mark 9 and verse 1, we saw that the kingdom was going to come with power. Now then, Jesus is again saying that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you'll receive that power at that time. When that power comes, again both in Mark and now then in Acts 1 and verse 6, the kingdom's going to come at that time. Well, we turn over to the next chapter because they were to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with that power from on high, according to Luke's account in Luke 24, verse 46 and following. And so we go to Jerusalem, and there all the apostles are they're together in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the power is going to come. And when that power comes, the kingdom will be established. And so we see in Acts second chapter, starting in verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The all there has reference to the apostles, as is seen in the previous chapter, the very last verse. Of course, it should be read without a chapter and verse division because that's the way it was written. And the they that he's talking about were all with one accord in one place. Is talking about the apostles now. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, or divided tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues or languages of man is what that means as the Spirit gave them utterance. But notice that in verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, when the Holy Ghost comes, they were going to receive power. We see them receiving that power as is evidenced by their being able to speak in tongues. That is, they were able to speak, not gibberish as the supposed tongues of our day, but they were able to speak without ever studying a language of man. I've never spoken Russian. When I went over to Russia for three weeks, I tried to learn a few words. I gave up. I could recognize them, but I couldn't say them. I couldn't get my mouth to work right to pronounce those words. Now then, if I went over there again, having forgotten even the words that I learned, and I was able to begin speaking Russian fluently, that would be a miracle. That would be the tongues that we read of here in Acts second chapter and throughout the Bible. It was never the gibberish that you hear those claiming that the tongue speakers expressing today. Thus they that's a demonstration of the power that they had when the Holy Spirit came upon them. But when we see that the Holy Spirit coming upon them, they receive the power. When they receive the power, you also have the coming of the kingdom. And so we have the kingdom coming at this time. But what do we find? Well, as we continue on in Acts chapter 2, he preaches this sermon to them, verses starting in verse 14 and going through verse 36. Verse 37, they were pricked in their hearts. They asked men and brethren, what shall we do? They are told what they need to do to have the remission of their sins. They need to repent and be baptized. And then 
It tells us that with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. As we continue in chapter 2 then, and come to the very last verse, verse 47. It says of these individuals that were now added unto them that they not only continued steadfastly in the doctrine and notice uh, actually uh, in verse uh, 42 that fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. Well, there again you have the power being demonstrated, the power that showed that the kingdom was going to be established when it came. But verse 47 then, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, it's those that are being saved. King James says that should be saved, it's literally those that are being saved. And so as one would be saved, he was added to the church by God. But wait, I thought it was the kingdom that was going to be established when that power came. And that the power would come with the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit came on this day of Pentecost. And thus the power came on the day of Pentecost. And thus it should have been the kingdom that they were being added to. They were. They were being added to the church. They were being added to the kingdom. Those two things are the same thing. But we also find that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper was going to be partaken in the kingdom. As Jesus instituted that supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine, as recorded in Matthew the 26th chapter and verse 29, he says, But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking to the apostles, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I'm going to drink it with you in the kingdom. As we turn over to 1 Corinthians, we first see in chapter 10 that he talks about having a communion with, the, with Christ. And then in chapter 11, and starting in verse 17 and going through the end of that chapter, he again discusses the aspect of the Lord's Supper. And he got calls to remembrance that which Jesus instituted. And goes through the, as Jesus instituted it in his discussion with these Corinthian brethren. And he says, you are now drinking it. But Jesus wasn't going to drink it, drink it with them until the kingdom came. It would be in the kingdom that he would do it. They were having communion with Christ chapter 10 and chapter 11 as they partook of the Lord's Supper. But they were the, it was the church at Corinth that was doing this. And we today do it. Why? Because we're in the kingdom. And so we have fellowship with Christ. We drink that fruit of the vine. We partake of the Lord's Supper in the church, in the kingdom. And in doing so, we have communion with Christ. He's drinking that fruit of the vine with us. In Colossians, the first chapter, in verse 12 and verse 13, Paul would write, Giving thanks unto, God, unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us, from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Here again is the kingdom being discussed, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God's dear son. And if you look at verse 12, he says he's giving thanks to the Father. He's made us meet to be partakers or worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Now notice that word saints. 
because the book of Colossians is written to the saints at Colossae. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's writing it to saints. He says these saints have been worthy to be partakers of that inheritance of the saints in light. And that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Who has He translated into the kingdom of God's Son? It's those saints to which He's writing. That's who has been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. But who are saints? Again, go back over to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. And in verse 2 it says, Under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus, or Christ Jesus our Lord, both theirs and ours. Literally, and I wish they had left the words out to be, where it says, called to be saints. It's in italics in King James because they're not in the original. It literally is called saints. It would be very proper to talk about Saint Brantley or Saint Kozad and refer to ourselves in such way or St. Worley, or St. Bourne, or anyone else who is a faithful Christian called saints. Now, we generally don't do that. In fact, it feels a little funny, doesn't it? To say saint so-and-so. They were called saints. But he says not only the church at Corinth, and he's writing again there to the saints, uh, to the church of God at Corinth. Those were in called saints. But then he adds to all them in every place they call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we call upon the name of the Lord, the way in which we call upon the name of the Lord is through that act of obedience in baptism, Acts 22 and verse 16. And so as we are baptized and come up out of that watery grave of baptism, we are now a saint. And God has then translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. But what are we in? We're in the church. Those in the church are the ones who are called saints. The ones in the church who are called saints are those who have been translated into the kingdom. Why? Because the kingdom and the church are the same. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the Hebrew writer in verse 23 and he begins really a section that's, and in this section uh, he's dealing with that you have come unto certain things. First, here in verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven to God and to God, the judge of all, and to the saints or spirits of just men made perfect. Then he says, the next verse, verse 24. Well, before we go there, though, notice he, we have come unto the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's the part that we really want to emphasize for our lesson this morning. But just to get the continued flow of it, he then says you come not only to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, you also come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And he describes Jesus and concern dealing with the things dealing with Jesus. To the blood of the sprinkling of, the, of uh, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. 
And he tells us and he informs us we're not to refuse him that spake, to refuse Christ. And says those who refuse those, or those who refused those ones who spake on earth, they received punishment. So we need to make sure that we do not uh, refuse him that spake from heaven. But then we come down to verse 28. And he says, While we have come to the church, or to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, we've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, he says, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You come, verse 23, to the church. What did you receive in coming to the church? You have received the kingdom. That's what you received when you came to the church. Why? Because they are one in the same institution. And so in coming to the church, you're receiving that kingdom. And by, <clears throat> by the way, while Matthew 16 and verse 18, we mentioned where it says that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, it is not teaching the eternal nature of the church there. It is here. So I said that that is not an unscriptural concept, but it's just that Matthew 16, 18 doesn't teach it. It does here in Hebrews 12 and verse 28. We have received a kingdom which cannot be moved. There's in that nature of the kingdom that it's going to continue until the end. That's the nature of the church. One more passage and then the lesson will be yours and that's in Revelation chapter 1. In verse 4, John identifies who he is writing to. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. He then gives a greeting. Grace be unto you and peace. He then identifies who this grace and peace comes from. From him who, which is and which uh, was and which is to come. There's God the Father. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. There's the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ. That's verse going into verse 5. And so you have all three of the divine being. Father, the Spirit, Christ. He then identifies and... Uh, gives us a beautiful introduction of Jesus Christ going on in verse 5 and actually going through verse 8. Then he returns now. Remember, he says, I'm writing to the seven churches in Asia. Now then he says in verse 9, I, John, who am your brother. Whose brother? Those of the seven churches in Asia. I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. They were going to be undergoing and were undergoing persecution. And he's writing to show them. And the book of Revelation, here it is, summed up, is the victory that the Christian has. That we are overcomers. We are going to overcome anything and everything that comes against us. There's the whole theme of Revelation. He's not trying to tell them what's going to happen 2,000 years from now or at that time. It's not an unfolding of history. He's saying that Satan is going to bring one thing after another against you and you're going to overcome. You're going to be victorious. And right now, you're in tribulation. I'm your companion in that tribulation. But then he says, I'm also your companion in the kingdom and patience, which is in of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. And then he identifies where he is. I was on the aisle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
And so he's writing to the seven churches in Asia. And he says, I am your companion in the kingdom. The way they were the, in the church. Yes, they were in the church. They were in the kingdom. They were in the kingdom. They were in the church. Why? Because they had been upon their obedience to Christ and being made saints, they became trans, or they were translated by God into the kingdom of His dear Son. When they obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ, Acts the second chapter, that they needed to repent and be baptized. Those that obeyed that, hear, or heard that word and received that word, they were baptized. They were added to the church. They were added to the kingdom by God. It's not something we join. That we don't join the church. We don't join the kingdom. But God takes us upon our obedience to His will and He adds us to that grand institution. That grand institution that is going to be victorious over all things that come against it. As long as we remain faithful to Him. You can be a member of that kingdom. It's not something in the future to look forward to. It's not something to pray that will come. It began in Pentecost, in Acts the second chapter, about 2,000 years ago. It's the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And we enter it today exactly the same way that they entered it on the day of Pentecost. And everyone who's entered into that church, into that kingdom since, has entered it in exactly the same way. If you want to enter it this morning, you can do so by your faith, Repenting of your sins, making a confession of your faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son, being baptized in water. And in that act of baptism, you will come up out of that watery grave of baptism called a saint. And having been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. If you have not continued in faithfulness to what that law and that rule of the kingdom is, and continue to submit yourself to King Jesus. Why not repent of your sins and come back into Him? Enjoy the salvation that's found therein. So if you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.